Jerry Saltz just wrote a book about how to be an artist. And back to this, oh, well, the topic of the discussion, I've completely changed my mind. And I'm always contradicting myself, and I probably will about five times during the course of the next hour. By the way, I have about 45 minutes to speak, and it takes me 45 minutes just to warm up. So I've never done anything in less than an hour. So forgive me. But I don't have a gallery, so I'm probably the last person that's qualified to stand up here and speak about galleries. And while I was thinking about this topic, I mean, there's been so much discussion about big galleries that are uh, stepping all over the smaller galleries. And I know that pretty much no matter what I say, I'm sure to alienate some of the people in this audience because there are people from small galleries, big galleries. My editor is here from Artnet where I write, so I'm bound to piss off more than one person, and I apologize before I get started. But Jerry Saltz just wrote a book on how to be an artist, and he's not an artist. Magnus Resch, who wrote a book on gallery management, and he never had a successful gallery. So I guess I'm in pretty good company. And when I did have a gallery for about five minutes, it was actually two years. It was designed by Vito Conchi, and I was pretty much the worst art dealer that ever dealt art. And I always joke that I can't sell drugs to a drug addict. And But as a result, because really, I mean, what I said, the title of this talk has no bearing on what I'm about to say, because obviously everyone believes in something, and I would never be presumptuous enough to say that it doesn't exist, whatever you all believe in. And... Um, I believe in art and I love art. And it's funny because I never, this was a space that I had for two years in New York before I moved to London for 15 years. It was designed by Vito Acconci and it was a great, amazing space. And I really never intended to have a gallery, to be honest with you, which I am painfully honest. Um, I did it just because I wanted to get close to him and to work with him because I thought he was such a genius. And Vito Acconci shifted from poetry to conceptual art, performance art, and he ended up in design and architecture and he designed this space for me, which was an extraordinary experience for two years. But I have carved out this kind of niche for myself in the art world. And what I love about the art world, I mean, there's so many people here that are doing such extraordinary things. People you've heard from this morning about how the internet is changing the way that people experience and consume art. And there's so many different models about how galleries could function today and in the future. And the fact is when I start, I mean, I, I study philosophy and I never knew art galleries existed until I was 27 years old, believe it or not. And now I'm far, far older than that. And I thought naively that art went from the artist and the studio right into a museum. And I went to museums when I was in university, but I had never gone to a gallery. And what I, for my, in my own practice, I, like I was said before, I do everything from writing about art. I've been teaching at the University of Zurich in the Executive Art Market Studies program for eight years. I've been teaching since the early 90s at the New School at NYU. Uh, at Rhode Island School of Design, I've lectured and done something at Columbia University, and now I recently uh, gave a class at School of Visual Arts and may continue teaching there. So what I am as a dealer is a dealer to dealer dealer. And I don't work with private collectors because I just don't have the personality for it, as you're about to find out. And I don't have the patience. But nevertheless, I mean, what I love about the art world is that there's there's no rules and regulations about how to have a gallery, what to do in a gallery, how they should function, why they should function. They're all different, and they always will be different, and they're wildly changing. This is just a stupid little drawing. But as far as making money in the art world, Ernst Beiler had a great uh, line at his 75th birthday party when he said, you make money selling art. Thank you for everyone who bought art from me and helped me enable me to fund this great foundation in Basel, but thank you more to the people that didn't buy art from me because you made me wealthy. Because when it comes to strict, again, there's a million different reasons to have a gallery. Making money is obviously not the first and the foremost because there are a hell, hell of a lot easier ways to make a living than having an art gallery, I'm afraid to say. But believing in art and loving art and collecting art is an extraordinary way to create wealth if you're passionate about it and dedicated about it like anything else. And that's exactly how Beiler ended up with his museum because of his great and vast and deep collection that he put together over the course of 50 years or more. This was from, actually there's an, an art gallery that I'll talk about, Edith Halpert, which opened in 1926 in New York. This quote in the middle of this schematic drawing is from Roberta Smith. And it's amazing to think about just the nature of this comment she made that art galleries, most of them are built to vanish. 
And in a way, that's kind of a sad notion, this fleeting aspect of art galleries, where most of them are not even intended to have a succession plan and to go from generation to generation or from investor to investor or whatever. It's very, I mean, so to backtrack a little, I studied philosophy and there was no philosophy jobs. And then I went to law school just to hide. I went to night, I told my family and my bosses that I was in night school, but there was no night school. And I just took the exams. And I had never been to a gallery until Warhol's estate sale uh, transpired in the late 80s in 1988 at Sotheby's. And I went there to procrastinate between jobs. And it wasn't just his art per se, but it was his collection. And they were also gearing up for another regular spring sale at Sotheby's. And I was just had an epiphany of sorts. I could not believe that art actually was something that was sold. Like I said before, I thought it just naively. I'm like an idiot, idiot savant and thought that it just immediately went into a museum. And I just couldn't believe the fact. And after that, I had actually passed the bar exam to be a lawyer. And I was as shocked as everybody else was around me who knew me. And I took a part-time job as a writer in a law firm. And then I went to a gallery. I saw an announcement in the New York Times. And there was a print show by Cy Twombly and Joseph Boys and Sigmar Polka. And I went into the gallery. And I was so taken aback that you could buy these treasures. And I. I didn't have any money, but I took a part-time job at a law firm, and I went to the bank and said, I would like $10,000, please, to buy some Cy Twombly prints. And they sort of turned their head sideways at me at the bank like you do when the dog doesn't understand the commands that you're giving it. And then they said, of course, no, flatly and quite explicitly. But then I had the manager of the law firm call up J.P. Morgan, and he told them how much money I was making, and I got the loan, and I immediately started dealing to other dealers. And at the time, before the YBAs and before, before the whole art scene in London popped up, uh, <laughs> it was really cologne. It was, I'll never forget, like in 1991, on the front page of the New York Times Magazine section was an article that what's the center of the contemporary art market? Is it Cologne or is it New York? And what I did at the time, I thought, like, they're great, great, great art dealers. And I'm thinking of like Colin Deland from American Fine Art and Pat Hearn in particular. They were just glorious human beings, impresarios fabulous people that nurtured artist career and were artists themselves. They have both since unfortunately passed away. But I thought that there was nothing I could bring to the table. And because I wasn't tied down to a physical space, I was able to travel. So I just traveled all over Germany nonstop while I was a part-time lawyer. And I would buy art and then sell it to either galleries, dealers like Andrea Rosen I sold stuff to, or I would like sort of arbitrage by buying stuff all over Germany and then selling it to the lawyers I was working with or to Sotheby's and Christie's. I remember I bought this multiple by John Chamberlain and I boldly walked into Pace Gallery and sat myself down and tried to sell it to them. And again, I got the same kind of resistance I did from J.P. Morgan Chase. And in the end, I put it into Sotheby's, this John Chamberlain multiple, and Pace bought it for themselves in any event, which is kind of very redolent of the kind of experience that you have. But back to the gallery situation. I, when I first walked into a contemporary art gallery in the late 80s, already well into my 20s, I was just taken aback. I was, I sort of, I hated galleries. I couldn't believe this kind of mentality where they would look you up and down, look at, I mean, I'm wearing pants now. I'm mostly prone not to, to walk around in my Adidas track pants. But they look you up and down, look at your shoes and make these, the, I mean, today, if you walk into Hauser & Wirth, which I'll get into a little bit, uh, hopefully no one's here from that gallery, I'm not so sure. But like, you can't even get the price of an art piece in a gallery anymore, which is like fucking ridiculous, if you ask me. I mean, these are shops, they're selling art, and you can't even, they're not even, they won't, you can't, you have to like speak to seven people before, layers before you can get past this kind of wall about just finding out how much the art course costs that they're selling. So anyway, my entire career, the art that I make, the writing that I do, speaking about these things, um, it's all a kind of reaction, not against, because I've grown to love dealers, art gallerists in particular, more than anyone else in the art world. Because I think, I mean, like I said, I can't sell art to private collectors. Either you like something or you can't, and I'm not the one that's going to convince you to buy it. But art dealers, most of them, or many of them, started out making art. They've already made this kind of conceptual leap of faith, and they love art probably more than anyone, at least as much as artists. And I love gallerists and love to speak to them. And I only do business mainly through other art dealers. Anyway, like as far as dealers not having succession plans, there's the Mugrabi family and the Named family. Uh, there's David Werner's son on the upper right-hand corner. There's Listen Gallery, father and son, Pace Gallery, the Aquavella 
family, but mostly galleries really, like Roberta Smith said, they sort of pass out of existence. Now you have these mega galleries today, which seems to be on the tip of everybody's tongue. And one of the biggest uh, questions is what's gonna happen when uh, Larry G passes on. And in between, he's created this new advisory business and he's hired Laura Paulson, who used to be head of Christie's. And he created this kind of leadership committee, but probably he probably doesn't care too much about what's gonna happen afterward. And I'm not being flippant about it, I just think that Larry, out of all of the mega galleries, I would say I probably have the most respect for Gagosian because he started with nothing and he's put on some of the very best shows I've ever seen in private institutions ever. I mean, to this day, I was left New York 16 years ago and one of the only shows that I remember from a gallery is like a, a Brancusi show that Gagosian did. And he also kept the eminent Picasso scholar John Richardson on his payroll for years who would do like one show every five years. And I was in talks with the Metropolitan Museum. There's no one from here, from there, here, is there? I was meant to do a show there and they had no money to paint the walls in the Metropolitan Museum between shows. They have no, I mean, the resources of public institutions today are so limited. And in a way, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna get into private museums so much now, but in my mind, to a certain extent, it's a travesty that so much resources, money, and art are going to private museums and leaving all of these amazing public institutions in the lurch and not able to carry on. I made a post about Hauser & Wirth the other day and someone said, oh yeah, that's a brand that does, a hotel brand that does collaborations with artists. <laughs> then I made another piece about the, sorry, Hauser, <laughs> I'm gonna hide, is anyone sleeping yet? You will be. Hauser & Wirth Hospice, I mean, now they're in fully fledged into the hotel business, farms, restaurants. The next step is an old age home. <laughs> then I made a bit of a joke the other day, they just stole George Kondo away from Pear Skarstad. I mean, you think about the allegiance, it's not just these big galleries that are poaching the artists, but George Kondo had a show up at Pear Skarstad Gallery, right in the middle of while his show is hanging on the wall, he decides to defect and go to another gallery. And that's really the world we live in. So it's not just the dealers that are complicit, it's the artists and everyone else who continues. And again, like, <laughs> it may not sound like it, but I, I couldn't, I think what every, whatever anyone does in the art world that enlarges is a good thing. I mean, believe it or not. I don't care if there are hedge fund people that are, if art becomes an asset class, if people are lending money on art, borrowing money on art, if they're in it to please their show off to their friends, whatever it is, it makes for a bigger and broader audience of people that participate. So I made this joke that Cause himself, like he also is with Pear Skarstad, that he went to Hauser as well. And then I had 200 phone calls, including from the art newspaper and various publications, whether or not he did, but he didn't. So this is something Roberta Smith just tweeted and posted yesterday. So again, it's like, she's really making this kind of sweeping generalization that these mega galleries are, 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 are bad. But you know, I don't see, I, I make fun of them. And at the same time, I don't really think they're bad at all because I was gonna originally talk about how these galleries are taking away all the opportunities and stealing the breath out of the mouths of the younger galleries. But then I was speaking to more and more people, especially Lisa Spellman from 303 Gallery, and she said something to me, which I have an image of some of the conversations we had, but she was just sick of hearing about, even though she is adamantly against the Hauser model of mega death galleries, but I mean, look, Bloomingdale's, a lot of people, you're not gonna go there if you wanna buy some funky t-shirt or something and go to this mega department store or Barney's, which used to be like one of the most highly regarded stores in the world is just went out of business. So it's not, I just think whatever it is, is like Jerry Saltz and Roberta themselves are constantly um, complaining about these big galleries, but so what really? They are because they are, but it doesn't mean that people, it's not a zero sum game where they're taking away every single opportunity from other people because there's just a million different ways to progress in this business. And throughout today and tomorrow, you're gonna to hear of some incredible stories of a gallery with 12 equity partners in the gallery, people that are utilizing the internet in various um, ingenious new ways. There's so many different models to proceed in this business. And really the contemporary art gallery as we know it, 
the white, I mean, all the architecture is the same in a sense. And that really pissed me off also. When I was getting started, every gallery is closed on Sunday, except in like the Lower East Side. And galleries keep the same hours. They all look the same, this kind of white cube. And if you think about it, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but some of the dialogue, which I was originally prominently thinking about before I started um, putting my notes together for this talk, was that there's been a hell of a lot of conversations in the last couple of years about how these small to mid-level galleries are suffering today. And there have been articles in the New York Times, there have, uh, sh sh what's Shane, this Campbell Gallery just closed, Shane Campbell in Chicago. And then there's been a lot of rhetoric about why these galleries are closing, that it's all about, <laughs> all about money and people, there's no more discourse. And these are some of the quotes of various galleries about the reasons of people closing. And I always used to joke, I would have museum groups come to my house and come and look at the collection. And I would say that I don't get to speak about art normally because I'm in the art business and nobody wants to hear about it. And everybody wants to hear like where the artist is showing, who's buying it, etc. Because really in a way, the critics have lost their teeth in a certain respect and it's the collectors that have taken over by having these, having like the Rebel collection in Miami sets a whole tone of collectors getting behind the artists that they're showcasing. But really, the art galleries are not a sacred cow and it's like any other business and art galleries have to change with the times. And if, if there are bigger galleries coming into the fore and taking business away, well, you have to be adaptable and flexible to the changing times, and they're changing so quickly. Again, just to make a kind of um, comparison to earlier times, this was an article by Roberta Smith in 1991 where the recession in the art world was far, far worse than it was even in 2008, and there was like so many more gallery closings, especially proportionate to how many galleries there are today back in the early 90s that it's, you can't even relate what happened then to what's happening now for these mid-level galleries. So again, this is my friend who wrote this book who only had a gallery that went out of business, but he wrote this book. And if you look at the number of galleries in existence today, there's a hell of a lot of galleries in the world. There's more artists than have ever worked before, more galleries than have ever been in existence before, and more of everything. So really, we're not in a crisis whatsoever. In fact, we're in burgeoning times, and it's more exciting. I've been in this business for 30 years in every capacity that you could be in, and I think it's pretty damn exciting times with more opportunities for people than ever before. Again, <laughs> people complain about art fairs the whole time, and there are great art fairs, and art fairs are an incredible resource to find information. It's not the best way to see art, obviously, in a stall with three walls where people come and go and their attention span is no more than a flea. But Ho Jose Friere from Team Gallery, he moaned and groaned and famously complained about art fairs, and then it turns out that he's having problems paying his artists and keeping up with paying his artists. So, I mean, in the art world, the degree of hypocrisy is enormous and keeps me thinking about all these different articles that I write and keeps me busy trying to write about it and, and bring light to it, but it never stops and it only seems to get exaggerated. This was a fair, really the first kind of alternative fair. So again, like Cologne was, was in existence before Basel as the first and foremost contemporary art fair in the world. So Cologne was launched prior to Basel for contemporary art, and the unfair was this, I mean, I don't mean to showcase the work of this artist who doesn't need any more attention than he has, but this was a piece he did in the unfair, and the unfair was one of the first alternative fairs um, in existence, and there are some great art fairs, the Independent, there's this fair in Paris where, th that's me in the bathtub, you know, there was an, there's an art gallery in Hove in the UK where they have their gallery in the back of a vape shop of all places. But there are incredible places to find art that you would not ordinarily find in some of these alternative art fairs. And really the Basel Fair and Freeze in LA is an extraordinary fair and the Armory in New York is, a, there's art fairs all over the world and they're not, I mean, it's, it would be a shame if it comes at the direct, um, again, this kind of zero sum economics mentality where if people would only go to art fairs and never go to galleries, that would be shameful in a sense. But when I started in the business, again, dating myself as to how old I am, if you wanted to communicate as a visual artist what you were doing, you would have to take a sheet of slides and send them in an envelope, and the gallery would hold them up to the light, and that was the only way that you were able to communicate visually what you were doing. And I remember an artist had contacted me and wrote me this whole letter, and he was living in Ohio, 
Brian Calvin. He's now showing with Anton Kern, and he gave me this whole letter about what can I do to break in, get a foothold into the system. It was during the recession in the early 90s, and I just simply wrote back, not to be brusque or anything, but I wrote, move to New York. And really, if you didn't move to one of the centers of where the markets were, in Germany, in America, in New York, or Los Angeles now, which is burgeoning, there was really no way to get started. And then now we have online sales and the internet, which are just exponentially growing. And it's incredible to think that, I mean, I've been writing since 1992, except no one ever read anything I ever wrote, because it was before, I'm not sure how many people do now, but that was before, I mean, the iPhone came out in 2007 only, and Instagram, which is apps, I mean, my kids always tell me how addicted I am and how awful it is that I never take my eyes away from the screen. But really, it's been like this wrecking ball, and it's democratized art in a way that just makes the hair stand up on my arm, because I have never seen anything that reduces the hierarchical nature of the art world. And back to like, when I first walked into these galleries and they just looked askance at me, knowing that I had no money to spend, except for Colin Deland, who said that I could pay him a dollar a week for a photograph for the rest of my life, which I thought was quite extraordinary of him. And he meant it, which is why he never quite succeeded business-wise. But you could be making art anywhere in the world. And it's, I, I read every day. I mean, I helped to cur I curated a small show in Los Angeles of a British modernist arti artist called Roger Hilton, which just opened uh, two days ago. And then there's another show, a painting show that was curated and largely many of the artists from the show came from Instagram. And I'm organizing a booth in Felix Art Fair coming up in February. It's again, a new alternative fair started by the art dealers, Moran Moran, two brothers and a collector. And I would say like three quarters of the artists, I'm, only I would do like a booth in this fair, which is a burgeoning, the only alternative fair to freeze right now that's commercially successful, but I'll end up losing money doing it because I'm showing 11 artists from like seven different countries in a teeny little hotel room, but that's just the nature of how I function. But I found a large number of the artists from Instagram and it's, a, again, nothing will ever substitute standing in front of a work of art, and I'm probably finished with time already, but <laughs> wake up. Um, it's funny because I used, when I first started and I was curating shows and I worked with young artists, I found them to be like very, very difficult people to work with, even though I'm one of them. And I've been told by my editor on a regular basis how awful I am and difficult I am. But I used to think like these artists behave as if they're curing diseases and they're not. And it turns out that I did some um, charity work with my kids in London at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, and they're actually accredited as a museum, the hospital, and they have a very proactive position of putting art in the public spaces and, and commissioning artists to make art for the rooms, and they've done clinical studies that as a result, the patients are having shorter hospital stays requiring less medication. So really, there's not a day, as much as, I mean, I can come off as very flippant, and I'm a bit of an asshole, I understand, but there's not a day that goes by in my life that I don't wake up out of bed and rub my nose against a drawing or a painting, and I started in drawings and work and prints because it's such an accessible way to collect art, and it really does make a difference in my life and with my family and the communication with my family. And in London for 15 years, I had an office with no windows but surrounded by art. So aside from selling art at some of these very boogeymen people that I mentioned, Hauser and Worth and David's Werner and Gagosian and all of these galleries and private dealers that I sell bits and pieces of my collection with, I just did a sale. When I was moving, it took like a shovel and four people working helping me to pack things up for four months because I just hoard things all the time. And I always envision like all of my art falling onto my head and suffocating me and killing me. So I did this ex online only sale at Sotheby's. And again, like Artsy, Paddleade, and all of these different companies and Artnet who I work for, they all, again, I don't bemoan anyone. I think the more people doing different things within the art world makes for a broader art world. And the more the merrier, I've always said that. And literally, like um, I, oh, I teach all the time, I thesis advise, people contact me from DM, from Instagram, all, I meet with any, in London, I just met, was there for two days before I came here and had three or four meetings from people that just contact me to speak to me for advice, whatever bad advice I can offer them. And I think it's so important. Well, so I sold 116 lots online only at Sotheby's and it went extraordinarily well and I had no reserve. And there were some complaints, like from two artists complained about the low, there were estimates but no reserve, so any price that someone bid would 
get them a piece of art if it was the winning bid. And there was one, there's this actor in London, here I go starting to misbehave, but Russell Tovey, I don't know him from a hole in the wall, and he wrote on my Instagram site when I posted a catalog of my sale and he said, it's shameful what I was doing. And you know, I said, I thought like, when I started there were five sociopaths in a gallery opening drinking Rolling Rock beer, and that was the audience. There was no audience for contemporary art the way now you have Kanye West saying he would trade two Grammys to be taken seriously in our world. I think it would take a few more. For, but I mean, Brad Pitt is making art with Thomas Halzigo, and Matt Dillon is making art, and now it's, I mean, it's, the world has changed. But this actor who has a podcast with a great dealer who works with Carl Friedman Gallery called Talking art or whatever it's called. Anyway, he said it was shameful that I was selling all this art. Nothing that I sold, I've owned less than four and a half years. There was pieces of art I've owned for 28 years, 20 years, 15 years. And I just thought like today, everyone puts their fingers up in the air and the wind blows and everyone wants to talk about contemporary art finally, after it had painted itself into a corner. And in America, at least nobody cared for so many decades. And I thought it was just plain bullshit that this actor is now has a podcast. And then I found out after he publicly criticized me for selling art of people that I've collected. I still have hundreds of things. I've been collecting art for 30 years and it's a very important aspect of what I do and I live with it and it makes a huge difference to me. And I buy it primarily from small galleries and you'll see in a subsequent image where. <laughs> but anyway, and then I found out that this actor in fact has sold stuff he's recently bought from various galleries. Two of them of which I mentioned in this talk which is just typical of all the kind of hypocrisy you find in our world. So when it comes to galleries and the history of galleries as we know them, Alfred Stieglitz, this was an incredible gallery from 1905 to 1917. I love the way that it had a skirt around it. <laughs> it's inspired me to do this for my next show. But like it's funny that first he had a fight, they, they looked at his partner, the other photographer. I mean, this was a time where they were trying to get photography taken seriously in a contemporary art context. And it took like literally almost 100 years for this, more than 100 years for this. It's still a battle of, in people's mindset of how photography fits in the discourse of contemporary art. But him and his partner, another famous photographer, they were arguing amongst each other on how to structure it. They had a consignment deal of 15%, which literally nothing changes in the art world. And I used to think that I was running away from big business when I went to law school to go into art, and then art became bigger than the business I was running away from. But at the same time, art was like more conservative than the art world, than all of the law firms I used to do part-time work for. Uh, and nothing really changes. It's such a backward-looking thing. So this is what I mentioned before. There was just an incredible show at the Jewish Museum in New York, and Roberta Smith wrote two reviews, one in 2006 about a book about Edith Halpert, which I highly recommend reading. And there was this exhibition, and this woman was like one of the two most successful business people in her mid-20s in, in, in New York City. She saved all of her money from being a consultant and opened a gallery, and it was one of the most significant, so far, far ahead of its time. And she was commercially very successful and represented some top flight galleries. And I love this. <laughs> some of the ideas that she had were just so cool. like. This ad she took out in a magazine, instead of jewelry, buying a car, buying fashion, or buying, that's a TV in the upper right-hand corner from days gone by, but why not buy art as a gift instead of all of these frivolous types of things, which is incredible when you think about. And also, she started the first gallery ever to have like a layaway plan, which, I mean, all of these things are employed today still by galleries. She also showed um, black artists, artists of color, way before it's become finally I mean, women and artists of color have been subjugated in our world for so many decades. Then you have artists like Baselitz, Sane and Der Spiegel and many other publications. The reason female artists have lower prices than men is for one good reason, that they can't paint. I mean, what an asshole, and there should be a bigger backlash against his market for even saying stuff like that on the public record, that it's just ridiculous. And finally, now things are changing, but this is nothing new. So this is something that, you know, 
I made a little bit of a joke here with all of these, but this was a letter from Edith Halpert to um, Marsden Hartley when she couldn't sell one of his paintings during the Great Depression. And she said, I can't even sell your painting for $300. There should be a, poor, a soup kitchen for millionaires. So I sort of changed it because everyone's complaining about the uncertainty in the art market today. I don't mean to be flippant about this, but people are complaining about the straits of the art world today. But the art world has grown more in the past 25 years than the previous 300 years. And another thing, when Edith Halper died, right even before the skull sale, which was the first time contemporary art ever ended an evening sale, and then it went dormant until the mid-90s, where really impressionist and modern art was the profit center for the art market, and the only art that ever sold at auction financially successfully was uh, impressionist and modern art until 1996, 97. But at the time, uh, Edith Halpert's collection was sold in the skull collection. That's Abby Rockefeller, and when she opened the Museum of Modern Art in uh, 1929, that was the first kind of uh, clinical white cube type architecture, and her husband was so unsupportive, she didn't even, it's not just because she was wealthy that she was able to start the MoMA, which was on like the 10th floor of a building on 57th Street, but she started it by getting donations from people because the husband wouldn't give any money whatsoever. Ultimately, he warmed up to contemporary art and he donated the location, which became MoMA as we know it. But this was the first time really, and the reason that they had this architecture of this white cube was to kind of confer value on like a Pollock painting which no one would conceive spending $3,000 for splatters on a canvas at the time. So this kind of model of a gallery was created to confer value and kind of a credibility and an imprimatur on the art when there was only a small handful of galleries in the world that were catering to it. Julian Levy, 1931 to 1949 was another amazing avant-garde dealer. And he was already playing and toying with the architecture of MoMA. And he incorporated these curving walls and film, which was, again, like extraordinary stuff happening then, which if you open the gallery today with curved walls like that, it would still be considered radical, shockingly enough. These are some of the shows he did. First show of Frida Kahlo. And then you have Betty Parsons, 1946. And on the top are some of the artists she began showing. And then you see that. Already, she was being poached for artists in the mid-40s, and she was really annoyed about this fact, but then she picked up subsequent artists. So you see the degree of, like, art dealing is like a rock in a, in a, in a creek where, I mean, she was annoyed by the fact that all of the artists that she nurtured were being poached, similar to what's happening today. Hauser and Wirth just announced two days ago that they have taken over the artist Simone Lee and trying demanding worldwide exclusivity, blah, blah. But this is nothing new. It's happened the whole time, and she just found some other artists who happened to be Agnes Martin and Jasper Johns among them. So to where we are today, this was my conversation with Lisa Spellman. And when I uh, first announced that I was going to talk about the death of mid-level galleries, I came around to the fact that, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I realized, like, I've never bought anything from Hauser & Wirth. I've never bought anything from David Werner. Sorry, in front row. But I've sold stuff through them. And even though I've pissed off some of these very people by nature of the revelatory writing that I do, still, I mean, if I have a painting that they want, they, th these galleries need art, these big galleries, because they're machines. So Hauser can't get by just showing the 90 artists that they presently represent. They also need to take additional secondary works. So if I have a blue Picasso, which someone I know in Zurich happens to have, I could be the biggest asshole in the world, and they're still going to deal with me because they need art to sell. And so Lisa was, I said, she was complaining about these big galleries. And she, I said, who cares? It just is what it is. And she said, she cares. And everyone she speaks to cares. But she's flourishing. And it was her idea in the first place to speak about successful mid-level galleries. And I just think, like, you know, Gagosian is a self-made person. And what he's done is extraordinary. And if he chooses to have a gallery in every beachhead across the world, I wouldn't if I was him. But he does, so who cares? I mean, really, if he wants to have a shop open 24 hours a day, that's his prerogative. And in fact, I don't think it takes away from the initiatives of other galleries. So I decided over Christmas to draft these very haphazard questions, which I sent to a series of like 27 galleries. Just silly things 
but things that immediately came into my mind in relationship to what is it like to have a gallery? Are these people really under the gun? Are they suffering? Are they angry? Are they, are they not making a living doing what they're doing? Because like I said before, there's like 19,000 galleries in the world today, so somebody's doing well. They're still getting up every morning and going, turning the, opening the doors and turning the lights on and doing shows. So this was a series of questions I asked, and this is the group of galleries that I questioned. And the ones on the left are the ones that didn't bother replying to me. The ones on the, on the right were kind enough to respond. And I even gave the date, because I sent out the questions on the 24th of December, <laughs> just before Christmas, and you could see when people replied. The little round circles next to each gallery are the galleries that I've bought stuff from before over the course of the last 30 years. So many of the galleries I bought stuff from still wouldn't be asked to reply to me, which is not surprising because my family rarely responds to me. And I always say the reason someone asked me, like, why am I here? Why am I speaking here? And I scratched my head and I thought a bit about it. And it's like, well, first of all, you're a captive audience and no one listens to me at home. And now you're all stuck here, whether you're sleeping or not. So you're here, obviously, to hear other people. But the fact is that as long as somebody calls me and wants to, I never say no. So I had five lectures in November. I'm speaking in Mexico after this and Switzerland and all over the universe. Just because like anyone who sends me a message and asks me a question, I respond because I feel it's my obligation. And I've been doing this for 30 years now and I've seen so many different changes and I've changed so much myself. I've already contradicted myself 17 times in the last uh, 40 minutes and I'll continue to do it. But the fact is I care so, 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 so deeply about what I'm doing. And that's really why everyone's here. And that's why I've grown to love art dealers so much because it is kind of a hapless, difficult job. It's a hapless life to lead, but you do it more because it chooses you than you choose to do it on a certain level. And the fact is that I feel like it's, I'm compelled to share all my experiences. And the reason I do all these lectures, I've never, spitting, I've never repeated the same lecture Ever. And I do it because it keeps me thinking and it keeps me focusing on these things that are so very important to me. And I think it makes me better at whatever it is that I do, actually, which I'm still trying to figure out. So like uh, Vanessa Carlo spoke here last year. She, made, she did mention something like there's no white artists that have anything to say anymore, even though she's got a stable filled with about half of male white artists. And again, like not one of the galleries that responded to this questionnaire, as ad hoc as it was, there was the kind of, con you see lots of continuity, lots of threads that they all have in common in relationship to their answers. And they all love what they're doing, like there's no tomorrow. They love art fairs, like she complained, she said how much she loves art fairs and the conversations and the great collectors that she has. At the same time, she complained about traveling. So you can't say I love traveling all over the world to go to fairs, but I hate traveling. I mean, I think the one disappointment I have in my life is that, it's incredible having lived before internet and getting my first computer when I was in law school in 1984, a big IBM thing. But the only, like, just to get on a plane and go from one location to another still takes so damn long. It's such a major disappointment that they, that they haven't been able to, like, deal with that issue because <laughs> then we can go to more art fairs. <laughs> This is a, young, a small gallery, only open one year, Von Ammon in Washington, DC. So most of the galleries are in America, which is where I come from. I just moved back after 15 years in the UK. I have three kids in college in New York, but there's galleries also from other countries. And everyone loved art and everybody couldn't conceive of doing any other thing. Canada Gallery, Catherine Bernhard just had a show that opened. Um, he was one of the few people that would rather his kids not go into the art world. For me, I would love if all of my kids went into art because it's really the only coinciding spheres of interest that we share amongst each other. And in that regard, I've curated shows with my kids in China, in LA, in New York, and in London. So Phil Grower's had the gallery for 20 years. I did a show with Catherine before in, back in 2003. Magenta Plains is a third year, a gallery on its third year. This is a young artist. Um, Ibeko Muslimova from a recent show she had. And it was, star it was actually the brainchild of an artist, David Deutsch, who's a mid-career artist, maybe in his early 60s in LA. And it was his idea to start the gallery and they put two partners together to run the gallery. One was his assistant and the other girl, Olivia Smith, who's the main kind of um, person running the show. But again, it's like there's no 
orthodoxy to the model of running a gallery. Um, there's so many different ways to do it. And all of you, I would say, know better than me. And the future is sitting right in this room. And there's going to be so many new ways to do it. And like even how Instagram has changed my life and changed the way that I that I access art and learn about things has been so monumentally profound that who's what's to come in the next three or four years is going to be even more earth shattering. That's another one of the paintings by Abeko. And she was drawing for 10 years and only just started painting about three years ago. And I think her work is quite extraordinary. Moran Moran is the gallery in LA. They just started um, feel, I ask, you know, like questions like a waiting list is like this total kind of fictional element that many galleries have where anyone jumps the waiting list if they're considered to be more hierarchically significant than the next person. But I mean, it's amazing how many galleries said that there are great young collectors that are involved in their business practices, that they're nurturing, that they have very super good... Re I mean, from what you would read, you would think there's not... I mean, I'm guilty myself because when I write about the high end of the auction market, about people flipping stuff and speculators and criminal activity and all of the shit that goes on, and there's plenty of it, and I've, suff I've been a victim of some of it recently myself, which I'll be writing about shortly... I mean, for me, I'm kind of like a pervert when it comes to all these terrible things that happened to me. At least it's the basis for another story to tell. But the fact is that none of these people were jaded or cynical that I spoke to. They were all really happy with the support system they had for their galleries. That's Tori Thornton, who's a young artist that shows with Moran Moran and various other galleries. This is an incredible, st I mean, of all the stories, I think this may be among the most incredible. PPOW Gallery. David Wanarowicz, one of the great artists of, who died of AIDS in the 90s. And Martin Wong. They've been around for 37 years. And this gallery, when you think about the perseverance and the tenacity in the face of showing political art through the boom in the 80s and all of these various times, like in the market today, where people just focus on the commercial aspects and the hotness of young artists and the sellability of artists. And these dealers have just stuck to their course with such great focus that it's just, it's an incredible success story. And now, after David Wanarovich just had this incredible traveling exhibition uh, that was in Spain and was all over the world, it's, an ama it's amazing to see the success that they're having commercially today uh, after all of these years. And now they, they sell out all of their shows. It's just a great story. And unlike my bad experience when I started, they continue to have great relationships with their artists and love them very much. But you talk about, one of the questions was about sexism and racism. And I think it's, even though things have changed and the doors are opening to the extent they've never opened before, we're far from parity in the world. And in terms of the commercialization of art, I just saw in, this, in the MACBA Museum an incredible group of posters by Guerrilla Girls pinpointing the kind of disparity between male and female artists. And, uh, and it's still terrible, but it's gotten much, much better than ever before. Lisa Spellman, 36 years of hard labor in the business. And this was an early show she did with Robert Gober and Christopher Wool before anyone was interested in either of their works when she first started. Funny, she said one of her best encounters was watching Jeff Koons clean his fish tank every five minutes because he's a little bit anal retentive. Jack Tilton was kidnapped. She didn't mention who the two artists were that kidnapped him. This is a young dealer in, in Vienna. Emelyn Gallery is in London, another emerging art gallery. That's Alvaro Barrington, who's uh, a young artist of color who they've been showing, who's had enormous success in a very short period of time. Genova Gambino, she made up this name because she thought when people owed her money, if her last name was Gambino, maybe they'd been moved to pay her quicker because it's the name of a famous mafioso family in America. I'm not sure if it worked. But again, like she, her gallery is about the size of the stage, and she plows through it and does a great job and shows incredible young artists. And 
these types of companies exist all over the world, like I said, and it gives great hope for someone as cynical as I may seem that you still discover great artists in these galleries, see great shows. And when there's a fair, like in Cologne, that's when you visit some of these galleries that you wouldn't ordinarily visit. So there's a kind of spillover effect from all of the reported prices of like 450 million for this quote unquote Da Vinci painting, which I've written about. At the same time, like with all of the negative things, when all of this stuff, you never read about these small galleries that are doing well. Why doesn't someone write an article in the newspaper about the, all of these galleries that are celebrating their spaces and their careers and, and their relationships with collectors, with critics, with museums? You just, it doesn't make for good news. So you just hear the headlines about how, I mean, I was getting sucked into it myself by starting to think about writing about just what I was reading until I just spoke to more people and kept an open mind. And the fact is that there are great opportunities today. And a lot of these people are thriving, 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 despite all the rhetoric and all the stories and all the bullshit that you hear again and again and again. It's really not really, it's not, that's not the case. And like I said, like if you saw all the dots, I've been buying way too much stuff. I'm hoarding again in my new place in New York and I can't stop because like most people, it becomes like a disease, but I just love patronizing these small spaces. And, and then you hear art is too expensive or you can buy, I, I buy posters, I buy prints. I'm so non-hierarchical in the way in my bedroom are posters and prints, prints by Christopher Wool print for $500. You can get stuff from any artist so accessibly. Go to art schools and buy paintings for under $1,000. It's really not the case that you read all the time, like art prices have grown so exponentially. It's just not so. And really, it's accessible as it was the first day that I got into the business and started by buying prints. Mitchell Innes Nash since 1996. It's all like kind of doing time, like being a lifer in prison by leading this life that we all lead. But what? think of the alternative. I mean, I couldn't think of a better thing to be standing here having all you guys, sorry, stuck listening to me, but it's joyful in a sense. And from here, I have to run off to Brussels where I'm gonna be curating a show and then to Hamburg where I've worked with Harold Falkenberg who has a private museum before. And then to Tokyo where I'm doing a show with um, Blum and Poe of my own artwork. I mean, I never would have dreamt 20 years ago or even five years ago that, that would, I would even have that opportunity. It's extraordinary that these people, as commercially successful as Blum and they didn't bother uh, replying to my questions, but they have offered me a small project space to do a show of my own work. And it was inconceivable that a gallery like that, which exhibited Nair and Murakami and Mark Rochon when there was no market for those artists. They've been in Tokyo for 30 years. Um, Fredericks Fraser, this is Jenna Gribbins. This was her first exhibition and now her career is launched into a I mean the paintings of 5,000 more or less and they sold out her show and this gallery has been running for decades and doing really well I mean they added they had negative comments about how I mean younger art young you, today at Phillips you can see paintings that still smell like paint that they're selling, which may not be the best thing. And again, like it's a normal course of business. If you buy something from a gallery and sell it six minutes later, well, that gallery is just never gonna sell you a piece of art again. And that makes perfect sense. And it's their prerogative to do so. But that's just the way it is. Carol Green has an incredible gallery. I remember she was working for John Good Gallery and I was showing the work of Rachel Harrison and she chose a few pieces for a group show she was curating. Rachel Harrison just had a retrospective at the Whitney Museum, which was an incredible show. And she didn't answer my questions, but she had good reason and she's running around and expanding her gallery like never before. She gave a nice recommendation to my kid, so I couldn't fault her for that. But then you have like, uh, Canal 47 is one of the top young young galleries in New York, and I get a comment like this, like, um, we bullshit. <laughs> I just wrote to him, like, how pretentious can you be? Like, I just asked you these simple questions to share with you guys in this talk, and a no com blanket, no commentary policy. So then, my friend sitting to the left of me, Georgina, tweeted this the other day, where she's cringing right now, but sorry, too bad. You did post it in social media. So Condo is this great kind of gallery sharing model started by Vanessa uh, Carlos. And Georgina couldn't get a conversation going with these. These are young galleries. And like this guy couldn't be asked to speak to me, but like why? I mean, I'm, it's not that I'm trying to exploit him or write an article and talking smack about him. I'm trying to share 
the success of his gallery. And then you get comments like this. And then like Maxwell Graham, who owns um, Essex Street Gallery, a great young gallery of conceptual art in New York. He said, I have like a no interview policy. And I'm like, well, I'm not interviewing you. I just have a few simple questions to ask of you. So this kind of, I mean, when I first started, it was this kind of mindset that turned me so off to galleries that everything I was doing was against this kind of attitude, which still exists today. The galleries are doing well, some are not doing well, some are struggling, some are thriving. But this kind of mindset you still find more in the art world, I would say, or in fashion or these other kind of snooty uh, professions where you experience this kind of attitude, which is just kind of sad because really art only exists when it's a means of communication and to share with you, which is the reason that I'm standing here. And again, like I don't mean to be like Hans Ulrich, who I really like and respect and dart off to the next event or the next thing because I have to go to Brussels. But, and I love Hans, but he's, I just made a joke in my last article that he's in like one of these Star Trek teleporters because he disappears from one opening to the next before uh, he's even finished with his own talk. But like I said, when I teach and I lecture to my kids' classes at 15 years old, to graduate school students, to anyone, I always say, because I don't have time today, but that's my email address. And if anyone has any question about anything, and I don't think I'm the greatest, most successful person to rely on for any advice or anything, because I'm not. But in any way that I can help share any information that I've gained over the past three decades, it would be my, I, I'd be happy to do so. And I feel like it's, that's what I do. So I will wrap it up is it just in time. If there's any questions, a few minutes of questions. If I didn't talk quickly, I wouldn't get 64 image slides in. Well, OK, I think. Uh-oh. Um, so uh, we have five minutes, seven minutes for questions for Kenny, if there are any. Oh, so welcome hello. questions. See? Yes, hello, Kenny. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting, as always. And I want to ask you a question. Is about You mentioned about a lot of galleries are quitting art fairs, and then people keep complaining about how tiring they are and are not really generating enough new clients or very cost. Uh, it's really costly to do art fairs. And we can see so many galleries are like people, they started doing alternative uh, exhibitions, like the exhibiting holiday places or outside of the white cube spaces. I mean, do you think uh, with the global, like a travel economy, like a gallery start searching out new options, like engage with the alternative space or maybe hospitality, do you think it's more like a, a more cost effective for mid-sized galleries? Or do you think it's more, uh, more experience economy focused rather than generating the real sales? Like what's the opportunity you see with well, the engaging of, with the travel? Out of the, out of the 11 people that responded to my questionnaire, not one of them said they didn't benefit financially from going to fairs. I think that it's absurd to do 15 fairs a year like some people have wanted to do. So I just think if you prune down the fairs, I mean, literally, not one person even complained about the, um, just about being there, physically, the existential part of sitting in a gallery in a fair booth. Everyone I spoke to had a positive experience from one fair or another and found it a crucial part for aspect of their business to meet new clients still. I mean, Jose Friere complained in two-part article, one part wasn't enough about how awful it was for him, but yet every single person that responded to me said that art fairs were continuing to be a very important, crucial part of their business model and they what still make money. If you do condo and you switch venues with another gallery, those things are great. And the more the merrier. There's another space in London, which is like a timeshare where you join as a membership and you can get a room in this building, which is in Kensington, and you can showcase your work. Sure, anything that works, works. But art fairs work. Otherwise, there wouldn't be six million of them. I mean, they've grown from like 50 at the, in the year 2000 to like 300 today, and that's not gonna change. If what would be the opportunity for mid-sized galleries to exhibit in alternative space, especially those travel destinations? I don't know. <laughs> Take over a space, work with another gallery, or go to one of these smaller fairs like Felix or the Independent or the International in Paris. There are these small fairs that are killing it. They're doing so well, and they're going to continue to do well. And 
there's in Brussels and there's in Cologne and every place in the universe. There was just one in China that did extraordinarily well. That was an alternative to Hong Kong because of the political unrest that's going on now. There's art fairs all over the world and they cater to different audiences and they're doing well. Otherwise, they, there would be 12 left and there aren't and they're gonna continue to do well. It's just, again, I just don't believe that's true. So you think he's not a good alternative? Anything that works financially is a good alternative. I can't say what that alternative is. Rent a space, pop up a space, do something in a hotel, do something in a friend's shop, do something in an apartment. Like I said with that stupid little graph, like get, find some clients and sell, sell, sell. I mean, art fairs generate traffic, whether you like it or not. When people have these Instagram reduced insta attention spans, myself included, I mean, go to an auction preview. You see the most incredible things in the quickest amount of time. It's like the best free lunch in town. Galleries, galleries are all over. There are so many different ways to consume art. But when it comes to buying art, art fairs exist because they work. I mean, they work for all of these people that I spoke to in a very profound, meaningful way. Not enough for them to stop it. None of them complained about it, other than they have to get on the plane and they're very costly. But if you're focused and your program warrants it and you have the good art, then you'll sell it in an art fair, whether it's not, it may not be Basel, it may not be Fries, it may not be the Armory or the big one, but there's another one somewhere that you will find a niche. Nothing's gonna replace art fairs anytime soon. Just not gonna happen. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you have interests and activity across different cultural industries. Do you think that we'll move towards a kind of elision of uh, different cultural industries? Or do you think that you know, fashion, music, media, art will always have their really distinct economies and businesses? Hmm. I mean, I think there's more crossover now than ever before. But still, I mean, art is art. And I mean, it's very, I mean, it's, I, I don't, <laughs> to admit how stupid I am, like I'm film illiterate. I lived in London for 15 years and I saw the Mormon thing, whatever it was, the Mormon show play. I don't go to, I don't, everything I do is art related seven days a week because I just think like, I love it so much and I'm so deep into it. But I mean, it's interesting that, I mean, in a way I could say good and bad about like all these fashion companies now. It's like art was this, I mean, in the 80s, there was one fashion TV show in the world with Elsa Clench on CNN, and there were no designers that were celebrities and supermodels and all of that. And I always used, to, I did a, a questionnaire where from Harlem to Wall, to, to Wall Street, I asked a series of questions to random people about art, if they knew about who some of the Matthew Barney was when he had a retrospective at the Guggenheim and nobody even knew who he was at the time. So I think like this whole thing with Louis Vuitton and Hermes and these all these scarves and Jonas Wood scarves and pajamas and Alex Israel sheets and blah, blah, blah. I mean, do we really need that? Is that a good thing? Whatever, I mean, I'm not gonna pass judgment on it. I know that I wouldn't be sleeping under Alex Israel's sheets. But, you know, I'm not going to say he shouldn't make them, but I don't think it's really furthering the cause of, like, I mean, really, art is not either you like it or you don't, and it's like a switch that turns on or off. And the fact that these this Korean pop groups are now, like, supporting art, I mean, please, stop. It's annoying. I just, it's all marketing, and I just hate to see, like, now, before fashion, art was, like, the last bastion that it was so like erudite and pissed off, alienated so many people because they created this environment where you had to be so brilliant even to understand what was hanging on the wall and you have to be rich and you have to be. So it's great that Instagram and these things are spreading the word out to a far wider audience than ever before. But these crossover things, I'm a little bit suspect because either you, I mean, it's great if it brings new people in. Swizz Beats is now like on the tour giving like, you know, curating shows and doing art fairs and again like great the more the merrier but like you know sometimes which really annoys me is like if you get me started like this whole like Virgil Abloh like bless him he's a genius obviously maybe I'm a little jealous but like him having a show at the museum in Chicago I mean that's terrible because there's only so many slots that the museum in Chicago has to showcase art in a given year and I understand that it's top box office draw to have like Bjork at MoMA and all of these James Franco and this whole Klaus Biesenbach thing of celebrity culture. But like they have their space, they have their money, they have their resources. Leave us alone and let us just refill the museums with art, you know, for the artists that need art. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. One more. Okay. 
So one more question for you, Kenny. Before I have a chance to dig myself further into it. Hi, Kenny. <laughs> Thank you for the informative talk. <laughs> Just to round it up, um, my question is personal. What still uh -oh. motivates you in the art world? What makes you believe in the art world still after you experienced the 80s, the 90s? <laughs> I mean, it's, to be honest, I just had, like, I had a terrible personal tragedy where I lost one of my kids, and it was really, I mean, it's inexplicable how the suffering and the grief that you experience, and I somehow was so naive to think that art would even make my family stick together forever, and all this economic stuff and all this art stuff is meaningless, really, in the big scheme of things when you face a tragedy like that, but honestly, again, like, every day of my life, I look at a piece of art, and it just makes me feel better. It's just, I love it so much. I would travel all over the world to give a talk to anyone about anything, and if I can help kids in relationship to what I suffered, I mean, at School of Visual Arts, I try to introduce my more personal experiences. I won't bog you down with these now, but I just think that, for me, art is like the only thing that helps me get up in the morning, and the reason I write these articles that often get me in trouble, and people try to beat me up in restaurants and threaten my life, as you can begin to see why, but I mean, that's all I believe in, to be honest with you. That's the only thing I believe in besides my family. And my feelings haven't diminished from the first day that I saw art in front of my eyes. And it's such an extraordinary, and I think like if I had 10 billion in the bank, I would pay a billion dollars for a painting. It wouldn't even phase me whatsoever. And the reason I love art dealers so much and gallery people in particular is that these people love the shit out of art more than anything in the world. Otherwise they wouldn't waste their time doing all these struggles that they're struggling through. And it just gives me such solace and such a peace of mind to just see the creativity, the manifestation of human creativity. And it still moves me so much. It's like when the Supreme Court were asked to define pornography and the judge said, I can't describe it for you, but I know it when I see it. And when I see a piece of art, which may look like junk to somebody else or may look repulsive, if it touches me in a way, it just gives me a reason, you know, and it still does. And I don't think it'll ever change. Okay. Thank you, Kenny.